Welcome everyone. My name is Annette Johns and I am the Associate Director of Policy and Practice with the Newfoundland and Labrador College of Social Workers. I have the honor of being the moderator for today's education event, Changing the Conversation, Motivational Interviewing in the Treatment of Substance Use Disorder. We have over 330 social workers from across Newfoundland and Labrador registered for this event this afternoon. It is always so wonderful when we can come together as a profession to learn from our social work colleagues and enhance our knowledge and skills in providing clients with the highest quality services. Sessions that focus on a theory, therapeutic approach, or practice intervention always generates a great response. In previous CE evaluations, members suggested that motivational interviewing would be a great CE topic for a webinar, and I'm so pleased that this is the focus for our webinar this afternoon. The webinar presentation will be approximately 75 minutes with about 15 minutes for questions. Please send in your questions throughout the presentation. Only myself and the presenters will see them. All the housekeeping details you need are included in the housekeeping widget that popped up when you first logged on. I now want to briefly introduce our speakers. Their full bios are included in the registration page for this event and on the, the webinar platform. Vanessa McIntyre is a registered social worker and works with the Bridges program with Eastern Health. Vanessa has worked extensively in the field of mental health and addictions for over 10 years in rural and urban settings. She also engages in private practice and is committed to promoting the social work profession through her work with the NLCSW Promotion of the Profession Committee. I'm proud to note that Vanessa was the 2018 recipient of the NLCSW Pride in the Profession Award. Paula Delahunty is also a registered social worker and works as an addictions coordinator with Eastern Health in St. John's. She has worked in the field of mental health and addictions for approximately 23 years. She currently provides services to the adult population in her clinical practice through individual and group therapy, as well as counseling with families and couples dealing with addictions issues. Paula is co-chair of the Regional Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder Committee and sits on the provincial FASD board. Vanessa and Paula bring such a wealth of practice experience, and I'm really looking forward to their presentation this afternoon. So on that note, I'll now pass the virtual podium over to them to begin the presentation. Thanks so much, Annette, and thanks to everybody who's on the session today. Vanessa and I, this is Paula speaking. Uh, Vanessa and I are both really excited to be here today and certainly um, embrace the opportunity to chat with you and hopefully generate some interest in motivational interviewing. For some people, this may be your first exposure to motivational interviewing. For others, you may have uh, quite an elaborate understanding and application of the practice. Um, but um, just for anybody who's not super familiar, I guess, to let you know that motivational interviewing is a conversational style of interviewing that's used in counseling to address the ambivalence that clients often experience when they're faced with a need to change. An empathetic reflection is used selectively um, throughout the process of motivational interviewing to reinforce reinforce certain points um, while de-emphasizing others. So the goal for our session today is really to provide people um, with a perspective on how motivational interviewing tools are relevant and useful for addressing substance use disorder, recognizing how the spirit of motivational interviewing promotes and supports a trauma-informed system of care. We also hope to create some interest amongst those of you um, who are here today to motivational interviewing as a technique and hopefully an interest in pursuing more training and practice in the area. Um, and also, you know, we hope to provide some hope as we recognize that working in the substance use disorder field can sometimes be quite daunting um, and sometimes can feel very um, disheartening at times and without hope. So we hope that this will help create some hope for those of you that there is certainly um, lots of hope in the area of substance use disorder. So just as there is goals for the session, we also have key learnings that we hope to uh, bring out throughout our presentation. Some questions I do want you to pose to yourself is, why do people change? How is motivation linked to substance use behavioral change? And how can we help clients enhance their motivation to engage in substance use disorder treatment and initiate recovery? And then what motivates people towards change? So the big thing is, is that motivation is a key to substance use behavior change. With the use of empathy, not authority and power, it's essential to enhancing client motivation to change. 
with the use of the trans theoretical model of the stages of change approach is a really useful overarching framework that can help you tailor specific counseling strategies to the different stages. And there's a big recognition that if we shift away, shift away from absence-only addiction treatment perspectives and more towards client-centered approaches, we can enhance motivation and reduce risk. So again, some other highlights to kind of point out is that motivation is really, truly essential uh, to substance use behavior change. And motivation is multidimensional, it's dynamic, it's fluctuating, and it can be enhanced and influenced by the counselor style as well as, as well as a variety of other factors, right? So there's a variety of benefits to using motivational counseling approaches, and those include, you know, enhancing client motivation towards change, preparing clients to enter into treatment, both engaging and retaining clients in treatment, um, increasing participation and involvement in treatment, and in turn, improving treatment outcomes. This also encourages a rapid return to treatment if clients relapse or return to misusing substances again. Motivation really truly is a critical element of behavior change that predicts clients' abstinence and reduction in substance use. And we'll talk throughout today's session how, you know, we cannot give clients their motivation, but we can help them identify the reasons for change and help facilitate their planning towards change. So a few more highlights to note. Um, the new perspective on addiction treatment includes focusing on client strength, strengths instead of deficits, offering person-centered treatment, shifting away from labeling clients, using empathy, focusing on early and brief interventions, recognizing that there's a range of severity of substance misuse, accepting risk reduction as a legitimate treatment goal, and providing access to integrated care. Each stage in the stages of change approach has a, a predominant experiential and behavioral catalyst, and for a client change, us as clinicians need to recognize that and need to focus on that. As well as counselors, we should adopt the principles of cultural responsiveness and adapt motivational interventions to those principles when treating clients from diverse backgrounds. Even mild substance use can impede functioning in individuals, especially those with lived experience of concurring severe mental illness, and counselors need to adapt motivational interventions for these clients. So when we look at what a clinical definition would be um, for motivational interviewing, you know, motivational interviewing is a person-centered counseling style for addressing the common problem of ambivalence about change. And that is um, a quote and definition direct from Miller and Rolnick, who are the founders of motivational interviewing. So they would say that motivation can be understood not as something one has, but rather as something one does. It involves recognizing the problem, searching for a way to change, and then beginning and sticking with that change strategy. They would say there are, in turn, or they are, it turns out, sorry, many ways to help people move towards such recognition and action. So, you know, motivational interviewing is a collaborative, goal-oriented style of communication with particular attention to the language of change. It's designed to strengthen personal motivation for commitment to a specific goal by eliciting and exploring the person's own reasons for change within an atmosphere of acceptance and compassion. So again, when we talk about motivation and what motivates people, um, we're still leaning heavy on Miller and Rolnick here. And the first sentence here, I, I joked to Paula, but I really meant it. This, if this is the only thing you take away or remember from today's session, um, it's a really important learning, and that is that no one is unmotivated. Motivation for change is a continual companion in life, and at times is the simplest finding the next meal or getting some sleep. When basic physical needs are satisfied, people pursue higher goals and values. A key in appreciating another's internal frame of reference is to understand their goals and values. What do people hope for and what do people want are questions to consider. And when you understand what people value, you have a key to what motivates them. So the big takeaway here is that empathetic reflection is used selectively to reinforce certain points while de-empathizing others. So motivational interviewing, as I mentioned before, is a collaborative conversation style 
for strengthening a person's own motivation and commitment towards change. So collaboration, as we all know, means partnership, right? So you as a clinician or the helper, you're not in charge of the person's change. Um, motivational interviewing is about mutual respect and participation in the process of change. So you're walking side by side with your client or dancing in sequence, so to speak. You know, you are not the fixer. Um, you are, again, you are, it's a mutual partnership where you're walking with your client towards the change process. So I'm briefly going to talk about some elements of effective motivational counseling approaches, one of which being frames, and frames is a foundation in um, MI approaches, and frames stands for feedback, responsibility, advice, menu of options, empathy, and self-sufficiency. When we look at the first part of this, the feedback piece, it's exactly what we all do in our day-to-day -day life, which is we provide feedback through active and reflective listening and through the use of open-ended questions with the individuals that we're working alongside. From a responsibility standpoint, um, as clinicians, we're responsible to make clear um, what the goals are, but also both what our responsibility is as a clinician and what the individual's responsibility is as a client. And we make that decision together. So what we do and how we decide that is together and how we move forward. Advice, um, I think that one is pretty self-explanatory for all of us on the line, but we're responsible as clinicians to provide helpful advice and information to the clients that we work alongside, recognizing that they don't need to take that advice because we are, you know, they are anonymous and autonomous in their decision making. The menu of options is that we give lots of different ones. Um, I'll talk later on about how we used to do things in the field of addiction services, and it was pretty limited and there wasn't a lot of options, but now we really look at working from giving a variety of options, meeting clients where they're to, and really working from that harm reduction lens. Empathy um, is the word of this presentation. You're going to hear us say it a lot, but it's a foundation um, in MI and that we need to make sure that our relationships are empathetic and that we provide empathy in our interactions with the clients we work, we work alongside. And self-efficiency is really important. So the aim is for us to build confidence um, in the clients that we work with in order to make that change. And we do this through decisional balancing, discrepancy development, flexible pacing, and maintaining contact with our clients. Um, I talked about the effectiveness for harm reduction and concurring disorder, and this is really important because as we, I said earlier, even mild substance misuse can impede that functioning um, for the clients we work alongside. So consider this, you know, as we mentioned before, motivation really truly is um, a critical key towards any sort of change. And motivation is multidimensional, it's dynamic and fluctuating. And it is influenced by both social interactions as well as a variety of other both internal and extrinsic factors. And motivation can be modified. And it's heavily influenced by a clinician's style. So it's the clinician's task to elicit and enhance motivation, not develop motivation, if that makes sense. You know, we all have reasons why we do or we do or do not want to do something, right? Um, Motivation, like I said, is multidimensional and is very much based on a person's individual values, their belief system, um, and an individual's goals. It can fluctuate and can change over time as people grow, learn more about themselves, have specific experiences. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, we cannot give clients motivation, but we can help them identify their reasons and their values um, for wanting change and we can help facilitate planning towards that change for them. So any successful treatment in substance use disorder approaches really acknowledge motivation as multidimensional, a, uh, you know, a fluid state during which people make different changes um, towards health risk behaviors like their substance misuse. So we're going to talk more about the clinician's role to bring forth that client's own intrinsic motivation when we look at the elements of MI, specifically around the evocation uh, piece. So MI helps us think differently about change. There is an assumption that because external factors and people, so our family, our friends, employers, et cetera, 
expect change is necessary, that an individual should be motivated towards that change. But just because the individual may not have the same agenda does not mean that there's no motivation for change. Everyone has motivation, like I stated earlier. The key is, disco the key is to discovering what motivation is for them and what motivates them. So for example, the expectation for an individual who has lived experience with opioid dependency might not be to quit their opiate use. The individual may not be ready, and, but they may be willing to either reduce the harms and re reduce um, the harms that impact their use. So it really is about looking at what motivates them and what stage of change that they're currently in. So we've talked a little bit about what motivational interviewing is. Um, we also want to make sure that people understand what motivational interviewing is not. Um, you know, there's an assumption, as Vanessa said, that because these external factors are expecting that change is required, that that instantly, you know, translates into the person should be ready to make changes. Um, that's not always the case. So the key is about discovering what their motivation, what motivates people, and what motivates them towards what specific change, because it may not necessarily be in line with the change that external individuals or factors think it is. Um, MI is certainly not about providing incentives to, to persuade or to convince people that they should change. It's also not about giving people a dose of their own reality or punish, punishing them um, in an attempt to convince them to change. You know, people know their own reality and they punish themselves enough. Um, MI is not just about being nice to people either. Um, it's not a technique to learn and then sort of tuck away in your toolbox. It's a style of being with people. It's an integration of particular skills to foster motivation towards change. MI is not a solution to all clinical problems either. You know, it blends well with other evidence-based clinical skills and approaches, um, but it's not a sort of cure-all or approach-all. Not everybody necessarily needs evoking. You know, when motivation for change is already really strong, um, we can move ahead with planning and implementation of goals with clients. But MI cannot be used to manufacture motivation that is not already there. That said, as Vanessa mentioned, you know, nobody is completely unmotivated. However, we need to be mindful that we're, you know, helping enhance motivation towards goals that are client-driven, not that we're trying to enforce goals towards change. So to stick with the theme of what motivational interviewing is not, um, historically in substance use disorder treatment, the assumption was made that clinicians were the all-knowing experts, and if clients would listen to us and follow our direction, that they would achieve abstinence and get better. And if you could see me, I'm putting air quotes to get better, um, and thank goodness we've moved away from this being our perspective, um, because we don't know best um, as addictions professionals, uh, we know a lot, and I'm not um, diminishing our, our value, but our, cl our clients are the experts um, in, their, in their treatment. But we really did think in the past, we thought that if we gave them insight, we gave them the knowledge and skills required to change, and then in turn, um, they would make those changes. And I know there's some people probably smiling on the line thinking if it was that easy. Mm -hmm. um, and when all else fails, if those things didn't work, then we gave them hell, right? Um, we continue to kind of, we just put it, laid it on thick. If you continue to use, you're going to die. We, you know, we did some extreme kind of fear mongering. Um, but this is what MI is not, and we've moved away from this um, as professionals. So the next um, slide we're going to show you is actually a video. We want you to play, pay close attention, I guess, to the skill, and I'm, if you can see me, I'm using quotes too, the skill set of the physician. Um, in this video. So I want you to watch the video and um, it may seem as you're watching it really blatantly obvious how ineffective this is, but that's exactly the point. We want you to talk about or sort of just think about and ponder on yourself while you're watching this video. Um, you know, when you think about the approach that this, this physician takes, um, you know, how shaming it can feel to the client, how blaming it can be how it's not a partnership. Um, you know, this is the way that once upon a time, um, you know, we used to take this approach to substance use disorder treatment, and really, this is, like I said, a very blatant, obvious um, demonstration of how that's not the way that we want to be working with our clients. 
Um, but as you watch it, you may be able to sort of relate to some of the discussion in terms of the reactions of the physician, some of the sort of telling the, the client or the patient what is required. So I'm going to ask you to watch this video, and then we'll chat a little bit about it um, briefly after you've had a chance to do that. Doctors, nurses, and physician assistants all have opportunities to counsel patients about health-related behaviors. As a medical professional, you have a responsibility to talk to your patients about tobacco use and how it affects their health. At times, you will also have a responsibility to talk to them about how secondhand exposure to their tobacco smoke affects other people's health. These can be sensitive topics, and it is important to keep in mind that the way you approach your patients about these issues will have a big impact on how your advice and concerns are received. In general, it is not useful to confront or scold your patients about their tobacco habits as that approach is usually not well received by patients and may interfere with your ability to counsel them effectively. Watch what happens as this provider becomes more and more confrontational in her warnings about tobacco use and her advice to quit smoking. Okay, so I wrote a prescription for an antibiotic for Aiden that should help with the ear infection, but in looking through the chart, I mean, it seems like he's had six or seven of these just in the past year or so. Yeah. That's really a big problem. Yeah, it, it's pretty stressful for both of us. I think it's really upset. Well, one of the primary risk mm -hmm. factors for multiple ear infections in kids is actually smoke exposure. Are you smoking? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I do smoke, but I don't smoke around him. I try really hard not to smoke around him. Well, the fact that he's having these ear infections is indicating to me that he is being exposed to smoke. And so what can you tell me mm -hmm. about that? I, I don't know. I mean, I try really hard not to smoke around him. I don't smoke in the car. Um, when he's home, I go outside to smoke. I just, I mean, I know it's bad, and I know it's bad for him, so I don't want him to be around it, so I try really hard. I really need you to quit smoking, both for your health and for Aiden. Did you know s smoking around your child is associated not only with ear infections, it, it could get to the point where you have to put tubes in his ears pretty shortly here, but also things like vitamin C deficiency, cavities, like dental cavities, behavior problems, um, asthma, other upper respiratory infections. It's really putting him at a lot of risk. In addition to that, kids of smokers end up smoking themselves. Do you want him to grow up to be a smoker? No, but I don't smoke. I, 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 I've thought about quitting, but it's just it's really hard, so I just don't know how to do it. Well, now's the time to quit. It's really gotten to the point where you can't keep smoking. Not only for him, like I said, but also for you. You're putting yourself at risk for lung cancer, for emphysema, for oral cancers, for heart disease, for all kinds of I things. I know, I know. I've heard. People have told me before I've heard all that. I just don't know how to do it. How am I supposed to quit? It's, it's so hard. Well, there's all kinds of things you can use now. It's not as hard as it used to be. You can use nicotine replacement. There's patches, there's lozenges, there's gum, there's the inhaler, there's nasal spray. We can talk about medications. You can try Chantix, you can try Zyban. There's quit smoking groups you can go to. There's hotlines you can I call. Just don't there's, have time there's for no any reason of that. why you shouldn't be able to quit. This is really important. I understand that. I know it is. It's I mean everybody has problems, right? It's just really it's really, really hard. Well, what can be more important to you than the health of your child? I don't know. I really need you to tell me that you're going to quit smoking. This is really important. I'll, I'll, I'll go look at all those things, and, and I'll find, I guess I'll, I'll try to find something, and, and I'll talk to my doctor about it. Okay, well, I think you really need to think about this seriously. Like I said, it's really putting yourself and your child in danger. Okay. Whatever. Okay. Okay. By starting the interaction with an accusatory question, are you smoking? The provider immediately put this parent on the defensive and minimized the likelihood. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, it was probably somewhat uh, apparent as you watched that video how ineffective that approach is. But just a couple of pieces to point out, I guess. Um, you know, the, as I mentioned, the doctor really 
kind of judgy, <laughs> for lack of a better um, way of saying it, you know, somewhat judgmental. Even her facial expression sort of spoke volumes, as did the client's body language. If you notice that, um, you know, she really shut down at one point, crossed her arms, sat back in her chair, like, mm, yeah, okay, I'll look into it. Um, you know, recognizing why this type of approach doesn't work. In order for change to occur, a person really must be ready to make those changes, and they must want to make those changes, um, and have that internal or intrinsic motivation towards um, change. They also must believe in their ability to make that change. Um, the doctor really lost a variety of opportunity in that interaction with the client, um, to sort of highlight some of that client's desire towards change, also missed uh, opportunities to talk about the person's fears, around change, um, some of the things that the person felt were sort of roadblocks towards change. But people are experts in their own lives, right? Um, they know their own reality, and we really need to hear their story and listen to what they're saying. Um, and MI is really about fostering the process um, for an individual to gain insight, knowledge, and skill without us giving it to them, right? Um, so, for example, this lady, she was, you know, struggling to quit smoking, um, and she, I'm sure she knows all the reasons why, you know, and she highlighted all the reasons why she knows she needs to quit, but some of the things that, um, you know, were roadblocks for her or reasons why she felt she wasn't ready yet, but the doctor unfortunately missed all those opportunities to have that discussion. So, just like Paula said, um, the doctor in that video didn't really take on what we would say an MI approach. Um, but we know that um, MI approaches work, especially with individuals who are looking to make changes, such as the woman in that video regarding um, you know, quitting smoking or different things like that. Um, the evidence says that MI helps clients move through their ambivalence to become mobilized towards change. Not only does it prepare people for change, but it helps people to initiate and maintain that change. MI promotes empathetic connection, which is a strong indicator of positive outcomes in clinical methods and techniques. It improves engagement, retention, as well as therapy outcomes. And the benefits of employing motivational enhanced techniques include inspiring that motivation for change, preparing clients to enter treatment, engaging and retaining those individuals in treatment, increasing their participation and involvement, as well as improving treatment outcomes. So it really, you know, as well, encourages a rapid return to treatment if symptoms reoccur. So, you know, we mentioned earlier that MI is not a sort of cure-all. It's not applicable all the time. It's, you know, it works really well on certain occasions, and other times it's not necessarily an appropriate approach to use. But MI can be particularly helpful when motivation is really low with an individual or that they have mixed feelings about change. And we'd say that that means that their ambivalence is high, right? Ambivalence is a very, very normal, natural part of the change process, and we're going to talk some more about that later as well. Um, but I'll, you know, recognizing that MI can be really helpful when ambivalence is high, um, you know, when people are if there's challenges in terms of engaging people towards treatment, or if people are experiencing difficulty in making changes for a variety of reasons, you know, for a variety of reasons. Um, research really shows that motivation-enhancing approaches are associated with greater participation in treatment. And as we mentioned, you know, reductions in the amount and the frequency of use. Um, and uh, motivational approaches are strongly um, associated with you know, better social adjustment, increased abstinence rates, and successful referrals to treatment. Um, and as, you know, we've mentioned, it feels like we're sort of repeating ourselves, but it's a really important, important point to recognize is that, you know, when we're um, using motivational approaches and people's motivation is driven from an intrinsic place versus an external factor, then the likelihood of them re-engaging in treatment after relapse occurs is much higher than it would be if they're, you know, extrinsically driven towards change. So I'm going to put the next um, slide is a video, and I love this video. And the reason I love it, it really highlights in a fun way uh, the power of internal motivation, and it shows us that it does intrinsically exist in all of us. So although we may not see it in a first meeting um, with a client, we all do have that internal motivation, and it's about drawing out 
what that motivation is for the individual. So I'm going to put up the video and then I just have a few quick words about it afterwards. <laughs> stage. 
if people are at the preparation stage of change, meaning they recognize a need to change, um, but they're not really quite sure what they need to do or what they can do or what they believe they're able to do um, to initiate change, then our role is in supporting them around developing that plan. Um, you know, in, if people are already have initiated change in the action stage of change, then our role is around helping, you know, maintain that motivation to keep, continue to mobilize that desire towards change. And when people, um, you know, have already made changes and they have sustained those changes for a period of time and they're in that maintenance stage of change, then our work can be around helping prevent relapse and, you know, again, helping create motivation to maintain the, the changes that they've already um, begun to make. We as clinicians strive to ensure we are using best practices across the continuum of care when working with our clients. MI fits with best practice. Um, the CCSA outlines best practices for each component of the continuum around the stages of change that we've talked about a lot. And however, there's overarching principles to be considered in implementing our services, MI fits within them. The individual who was experiencing harm from their opioid substance use, I talked about earlier um, as an example, their ultimate goal of treatment may be safer use. It could be abstinence. It could be opioid maintenance, obtaining certain functional outcomes. It really can exist across that continuum. And with the input from a care provider, so us as clinicians, who has experience with substance use management and working alongside the individual, that's when we're really mirroring the best practices of what MI really is about. Treatment plan and services used can be determined together with the individual and customized to meet their needs. As I just said up top, there can be several different goals um, that individuals present with. And services should always be culturally competent, um, safe, trauma, and gender informed. And when using MI, um, we must be always mindful that we work through those lenses. So the spirit of motivational interviewing is key you know, that we're operating within the spirit. Without the spirit of MI, you know, MI sort of becomes this cynical trick or, uh, you know, a way of manipulating people and doing what uh, they might not want to do. And that's certainly not our key as helpful clinicians or professionals. You know, but, you know, the spirit of MI um, really tells us that if we treat an individual as he or she is, he or she will stay as he or she is. But if we treat them as they were ought to be and they could be, then they will become what they, are, they ought to be and could be. You know, as we said, motivation is truly a key to substance use behavior change, to any behavioral change for that matter. But, you know, counselors or clinicians, well, as, as support people, we can support the clients moving towards change um, in their substance use by identifying and enhance, enhancing the motivation that already exists within them. Um, and these approaches are always person-centered, right? We're using empathy, not authority and power. To, and that's the key, you know, to enhancing the client's motivation towards change. And always remembering that a client is an expert in his or her own life, um, in their own recovery from substance use disorder and in their own experience of substance use disorder. We really need to be engaging them in that collaborative partnership. This model is always focused on strength and confidence. Um, we want to ensure that we're always seeing the experience in context of the client's life, and we appreciate that recovery is personal. You know, it must be defined by the individual themselves, not us as clinicians. It's our goal or our role, I guess, to be a guide towards that change, not a fixer. We're not the change agent. The client is the change agent. So sticking with the spirit of MI, there are four elements that over the next uh, four slides we're going to break down and really explain for you. Those are partnership, acceptance, compassion, and evocation. So the first of those elements um, is partnership. It's the first of the four central components of the underlying spirit of motivational interviewing. And that's where the interviewer, you know, the individual uh, clinician is really functioning as partner or companion and collaborating with the client's own expertise. So this means that MI is done for and with the client. 
Um, you know, and as we said earlier, individuals or clients are the undisputed experts on themselves. We should not ever make assumptions that we know more about a client's experience, about um, a client's needs, about a client's goals than they know themselves. They are the undisputed expert. Um, in motivational interviewing, the clinician is a companion who typically does less than half of the talking. Um, and for some of us as clinicians, maybe that will be a bit of an adjustment, right, in learning that um, you know, we're not the expert and we're not the one who needs to have all the answers or to do all the talking. We need to sort of pass the oars, so to speak, in the boat back to a client who will um, explain our analogy later. Um, but you know, we think about this process, the partnership is, um, you know, the client is really steering the boat or rowing the boat towards um, change. And our emphasis here is really on awareness and honesty, I guess regarding an individual's own values and agenda in the conversation about change. And in comparison to in the past when we would have maybe tried to confront an individual, giving them a dose of reality, some of that fear mongering that we mentioned earlier, um, you know, in hopes of, you know, initiating change by means of fear. You know, that's not what MI is about. Acceptance is the second of the components of the underlying spirit of MI by which the interviewer, the clinician, um, communicates. So underneath acceptance, um, we talk about absolute worth, and that's prizing the inherent value and the potential of every human being. Acceptance really stands out for me because it really highlights our social work code of ethics values um, because we do intrinsically know um, that everyone has that worth and value. The second component is the accurate empathy, the skill of perceiving and reflecting back another person's meaning. We look at autonomy for support, which is when us as clinicians accept and confirm that clients have the right to self-determination and choice. And then the final part of this is affirmation of support, where we look at the positives, we seek and acknowledge that the person has their own strengths and efforts, and we highlight for them as a means of motivation towards that change. If we take these four person-centered conditions into consideration, they really do convey what we mean by acceptance. Profound acceptance of what the client brings does not necessarily mean that we as clinicians approve of the client's actions. In fact, our approval or disapproval is irrelevant. The third element is compassion. Um, and this is central to the underlying spirit of MI. And it's where the clinician acts benevolently to promote the client's welfare, giving priority to the client's needs. Um, the Dalai Lama would say, compassion is the wish to see others from suffering. Um, you know, it's a really important piece of this, right? And it was added because it is certainly possible for us to practice the other three elements um, of the spirit of motivational interviewing in the pursuit of self-interest. Um, because really to work with the spirit of compassion is to have your heart in the right place so that the trust that we, you know, in gender would be deserved. Um, but, for example, you can't say that you accept a client's right to self-determination um, if you're not compassionate in that acceptance, because is that really true acceptance? You know, if a person is no-show, for example, for their appointment, you know, you might say, well, you know, they have a right to be here or not. I guess he's not ready to make change, so I'll close his file now. <laughs> you know, um, is that really being compassionate? So it's the underlying, compassion is the underlying perspective in which we practice motivational interviewing. Um, you know, also important recognizing that these are not prerequisites for the practice of motivational interviewing. Um, you know, Miller and Rolnick would, uh, would say to us, you know, if one first has to become profoundly accepting and compassionate before being able to practice motivational interviewing, the wait would be a lifetime. Um, so recognizing that rather it's an experience that the practice of motivational interviewing itself teaches us these four habits of the heart as clinicians and as helpers. So the final component that underlies the spirit of MI is evocation, and this is when the clinician elicits the client's own perspective and motivation. It starts from a strength-focused premise that people already have within them, much of what is needed, and your task 
Our task as clinicians is to evoke it and to call it forth. From research on MI, it is realized that once a person resolves their ambivalence about change, they often went ahead and did it on their own without additional professional assistance or permission. Our task is to evoke and strengthen the change motivators that are already present. And this really is the underlying perspective which one practices when utilizing the MI approach. So as I mentioned, you know, these four elements are what make up the spirit of MI. So when you have, um, you know, all four of these elements operating in unison and, you know, in cooperation with each other, then the true spirit emerges at the intersection of these four components. Um, and the heart of MI is empathy, as we've mentioned before. And MI, the spirit of MI really manifests, em manifests I guess, empathy in the counseling relationship in these four ways that we've just mentioned, right? Through partnership, through compassion, through acceptance and evocation. So the four elements that we've discussed really look at and really make us consider what are the person's goals for change? As clinicians, we have to recognize, do I have different goals than the person? Are we working towards a common purpose do I have a clear sense of where we're going? And are we moving towards different directions? This is really important because we need to respect the client's autonomy and we need to be okay with it. It's their choice to make in regards of how they want to move forward and decisions they make in regards to change. And it's really important that we respect that. And you know, that can be really challenging. Um, you know, in terms of respecting a people, a person's um, autonomy, we probably all have had experience with clients who, you know, we see the detriment of their substance use. We see the risk connected to their lifestyle. Um, and, you know, we feel this obligation ethically to highlight to them all the risk associated with their use. And it can be really, really difficult. Um, and, you know, really challenging as clinicians to sort of sit back and accept a client's right to not change as well, you know, or to continue down a road that we know may very well land them, you know, in a very unfortunate circumstance. But, you know, the spirit of motivational interviewing really does um, dictate a need for us to respect an individual's autonomy towards change or lack thereof. Um, as I mentioned earlier, ambivalence is a central part of the change process, regardless if we're talking about substance use disorder and substance use behaviors or if we're just talking about any sort of change. Um, for any of us who have made any significant change in our lives, I'm sure we can recognize that you know, there are often times of time um, you know, prior to change occurring where there's this state of coexisting and conflicting feelings about the change. Um, you know, everybody who is probably online may have had an experience of, you know, come January 1st, we all make New Year's resolutions around going to the gym, eating better, you know, changing our lifestyle, changing our, our wellness, um, you know, and there's always, oh, I know I need to do this, but, right? Um, so wanting change to occur, but also wanting to remain, you know, status quo, not wanting to change, right? Because change is challenging, change is scary. Um, but ambivalence certainly is a very normal part of that change process. So there's, there's ambivalence, which is very normal, and then there's total ambivalence when a person is feeling stuck, right? So that's when there's equal weight attached to staying the same or continuing as is versus changing. So then what happens? Nothing. No movement occurs, right? People get stuck um, in that heightened ambivalence. Um, we can help people by helping them explore that ambivalence through a tool uh, that we use regularly in the substance use disorder field uh, called the decisional balance. And we actually have attached that um, in the files section um, later. So we'll talk about that after. But, and we'll also explore that tool. Um, but the spirit of motivational interviewing really embodies the principles of you know, exploring this ambivalence. And so thinking as well, when we consider what ambivalence means, it's that, you know, I'm ready to change, but, or I know I need to change, however, I'm not sure. Um, you know, so there's equal, like I said, there's equal um, benefit attached to staying the same or changing. So our role is to help people explore, um, you know, the pros and the cons. So recognizing, too, that when we take a step in one direction, 
then the other one starts to look better, right? The closer you get to one alternative, the more its disadvantages become apparent. Um, while, you know, sort of nostalgia for the other beckons as well, right? So a common pattern is to think of a reason for changing, um, but then think of reasons why we shouldn't change. And then just stop thinking about it because, okay, I've justified the reason why I could stay the same, right? So the path out of ambivalence is to choose a direction and to follow it, really, and to keep moving in the, the chosen direction. So, and as I said, the, there's some tools that we'll, we'll um, share with you later that would be helpful in exploring that with people and helping weigh pros and cons um, as a way to move forward. So it's really important when we're talking about MI to know the difference between sustained TAC and change TAC. Sustained TAC is essentially the statements that clients make for not changing. So those are the statements we make for, you know, maintaining the status quo. And change TAC is the statements that clients make in favor of change. The key is helping the clients move in a direction towards changing their substance use behavior to invoke change TAC and soften or lessen the impact of sustained TAC on the client's decision-making process. So our role is to help create the movement, um, and we do that through different tools. Um, Paula already mentioned one, like the decisional balance, and we'll explain how um, that's a useful tool to do that. But it's about recognizing that for some people, um, they need to kind of look at moving. They might not be ambivalent, um, and they might think that they don't need to change, and they are so pre-pre-contemplative. Um, so really, it's hard to kind of develop that ambivalence about change, but this is where we use the task to help make them make those steps forward. So, you know, there's different tasks that we as the helpers can take on, I guess, so that we can explore um, applying when ambivalence is really high. Um, so our, our task as the clinician is really to focus on normalizing and resolving a client's ambivalence and help them tip that decisional balance towards changing their substance use behavior. It's also our role to help reassure them that ambivalence about change is normal. And also, while doing so, trying to invoke some of that darn language. And so we call the darn language, it's the language that tells us that there's a desire towards change, that a person feels that they have an ability to make those changes, um, the language that gives them reason towards change, so that's identifying some of their values and their beliefs, um, and some of the reasons, sorry, the reasons and also some of the needs that they feel change needs to occur. And that's the change talk. Um, that Vanessa referenced earlier. And we can do this, um, you know, highlighting that by summarizing what the client is sharing with us. Um, we can also reinforce the movement towards change, right? As we're working with our clients, we are exploring their self-efficacy and we're summarizing their client change talk. And by providing those summaries, we're allowing them not only to hear their own change talk, but to hear it repeated and to reinforce that change talk. Um, also, our role is to encourage the client to strengthen their own commitment towards change by taking small steps, you know, small achievable steps that they feel that they can maintain and that they can achieve. Um, you know, encouraging them to say go public, for example, with their decision to make changes, which creates accountability. Helping them envision a life after the change has occurred in their substance use behavior. And also, you know, using the oars to help steer that boat towards change. And Vanessa is going to talk a little bit about um, the oars now in a moment. Um, so as Paula says, um, we've used the acronym oars, um, and we talked about that analogy of allowing them to steer their boat, which is um, a foundation. Um, it describes the core skill of MI. So the acronym oars stands for asking open-ended questions, affirming the client's strengths, using reflective listening, and summarizing client's statements. Reflective listening is a fundamental person-centered counseling approach, and MI in particular um, is the foundation of that and is really essential in expressing empathy. So the principles of motivational interviewing are, you know, expressing empathy, as you mentioned earlier, through reflective listening. So asking open-ended questions such as, you know, um, you know, what are the concerns you have around your opioid use? And then we're listening um, and reflecting back, expressing appropriate empathy. So, you know, the idea of changing opioid use must be frightening for you. 
um, you know, we want to dis develop discrepancies. And by developing a discrepancy, what we're trying to do is highlight the discrepancy between the client's current behavior and their goal or their values. You know, I oftentimes um, ask people to envision a fork in the road where, you know, towards the right-hand side is, you know, the road that takes you towards the life that you want. The left-hand side is the, what I call the away moves, right? And the right-hand side are the towards moves. So if you're, you know, working, continuing to use your substance use, your substance um, of choice, um, is the choice to do so, is that taking you uh, toward moves, towards the life you want, or away moves, away from the life that you desire and the life that you deserve. Um, so helping people develop that discrepancy between how their current behavior may not be in line with their future goals or their, their ideas about what they want their life to look like. Also, you know, reflecting back on the content from the client. You know, so listening in, in listening sort of those ambivalent statements that we hear from them um, with non-judgment, but doing that in a reflective listening way, asking about their goals and how, uh, you know, their substance use either helps or does not help towards that goal. And also, you know, avoiding argumentation and direct confrontation with individuals. Um, you know, we're arguing for one side, the ambivalent person is likely going to take up and defend the opposite. That's just the nature of human reaction, you know. Um, sometimes we see this ambivalence as denial or resistance or sort of being oppositional, but that's not what it is. You know, we need to recognize this for what it is, and it's the ambivalence, which is a very normal part. So roll with that, you know, um, to be able to embrace that ambivalence and avoid arguing about it. Um, and actually allow for an opportunity to discuss that. So sticking with the principles of MI, we need to adjust to resistance rather than opposing it directly. Paula mentioned earlier in this presentation the concept of wrestling versus dancing. So remember that you should feel like you're dancing with your client. You're letting him, her, them lead the way, and you feel like you feel as if you're not wrestling them, but in fact there's a clear indication that you're trying to move alongside with them um, and move towards that change. We really need to roll with ambivalence. So we continue with our example of the individual who has lived experience with opioid dependency. They might present with saying, I don't need Suboxone. They're not interested in that. And instead of kind of saying, well, you're not ready to make this change or you're not ready for that, we want to support self-sufficiency and optimism. So in, instead, we may ask permission to provide them with evidence-based information, which can help them further make decisions or look at the other options. So a way that we can do that is some people with an opioid use disorder require medication to help with a craving withdrawal. Would you like to learn more? And by putting that out there and giving them that opportunity, it really reinforces that the person's considering change because we can then follow up with that. I think it's really great that you want to hear a bit more options. I uh, wanted to provide you, I guess, an opportunity to have another tool that we kind of have in our toolbox that we use oftentimes with clients, and it's our change plan worksheet. And this can be a really helpful tool in helping clients explore, I guess, their desire towards change and sort of what motivates that change. Um, you know, so you can actually use this as a paper and pen activity with clients, or you can just, you know, have these questions sort of in the back of your mind that you can use to generate discussion in sessions with clients or in interactions with clients. So asking things like, you know, what are the changes that they want to make? Again, this is going to help identify the client's desire towards change and their own value system that's driving that change. Um, you know, what are the most important reasons why they want to make these changes? You know, is it because they want to get everybody off their back, or is it because they truly don't want to live this life anymore? They want the change to occur. What are the things that they plan to do in making those changes happen? Um, you know, what are the ways that other people can help them? What kind of support network do they need to have in place to make these changes realistic and achievable? And how will they know that they're succeeding? How will they feel success is happening? You know, how will they know that that plan is working? And what are some of the things that could potentially jeopardize that plan for them? You know, what are some of the triggers? What are some of the risks? What are some of the high-risk um, 
times, people, places, or things that could interfere with that. So, you know, there's a lot of ways that we can engage a discussion with people to help us understand more about their goals and their values, um, you know, their perceived fears about change, and also their excitement about change, their vision of what their life would be after the change has been maintained for a period of time. And this worksheet, like I said, either as a paper pen activity or as just a general discussion can be a really valuable um, means of accessing that information while at the same time building that therapeutic alliance with your client. Because again, it's about a partnership. So this next resource, which we uh, have included for you as well, um, is the Readiness Ruler. And this is a great um, tool. It's pretty um, user-friendly, it's pretty simple and straightforward, but it's really important because it helps us assess that readiness for change. So we talked a lot about the stage of the change model and looking at that trans-theoretical model and help us figure out where the client is at, because that's where we want to start to, because they are, like we talked about, they're leading any change and they're leading the, the process in which we're moving forward. So it really helps us look at an individual's confidence in their ability to initiate change. This tool also helps us determine whether or not they feel it's important to make these changes, because the other thing is, as Paula mentioned, sometimes people land in our offices because someone else has either dragged them in or push them towards it. So this helps us look at, in fact, do they see that this is an importance for them? Is it important to make the change? What motivates them? How confident are they in their ability? And if those external factors do exist, that is driving it for them. So this is the decisional balance tool that we referenced earlier. Um, and at that pre-contemplative stage of change, it can be useful, but more so in the contemplative stage of change. This can be a very, very invaluable tool. And again, like I said, this can be a paper pen activity or it can just help generate a discussion with an individual. Um, and that decisional balance is really, really a, a way to process ambivalence. And in turn, we hope that it increases motivation towards change from the intrinsic place. Um, one thing that helps people when thinking about change is to really list, you know, in one place the benefits and costs of changing. Um, behavior or staying the same. You know, I know myself, I'm a list person, and any of you who know me well know that I'm very visual. I do everything in lists, um, and I'm big on traditional balances in every aspect of my life, and so it's natural for me to use this um, as a means of supporting clients and helping them process their own ambivalence. Um, so, you know, being able to see a full array, I guess, of both the pros and cons of staying the same and pros and cons of change can be really helpful. It's also really noteworthy um, to recognize that it's not about the number of items in each quadrant that's important. It's about recognizing the value attached to each of the items in each quadrant. For example, you know, um, an individual may be able to list, you know, 47 reasons why quitting the opioid use um, is necessary or why it would be beneficial. And so it may, you know, looking at that in black and white, may say, it may make sense that, okay, well, it's just given that you need to stop uh, using. It makes sense to change. But perhaps one of the reasons on their continuing to use, like, list of pros is that it helps me forget. And if a person has a history of trauma, if a person has a history of, um, you know, pain, a person has experienced significant grief, and their substance use is their only means of coping with that, then that one mean uh, or that one purpose behind their use far outweighs the 47 reasons why they should stop. And that's important. One of the things that the decisional balance tool allows or that discussion allows is allowing people to, you know, talk about the benefit of their use, which oftentimes we don't, we don't allow for, right? In traditional substance use disorder treatment, you know, we spend a lot of time highlighting all of the risks and all the problems and all of the difficulty connected to a person's substance use. And maybe we haven't allowed people an opportunity to talk about the reasons why they continue to use, despite all of the problems connected to their use. So we need to remember as clinicians that all behavior is purposeful. And it has, like being able to attach the value of a person's continued use despite their problems is key to initiating the skills needed to make the change occur. So MI is built on the foundation of four main 
processes. And these four processes emerge in a sequential order. If you picture like rungs on a ladder, um, each ladder process builds upon the other in which it was laid to make and run that foundation for MI. So the first is engaging, shall we work together? And this is the first brick, so to speak, in the foundation. Focusing is about what will we work on to change. Evoking or evocation is why is the change desired and what motivates change. And then the final step is how will change happen, and that's in the planning process. You never stop engaging your client along this path, and once a person resolves their ambivalence, you help them focus towards what they would want to change at this point, while always engaging in the change process. Likewise, when a person's making plans for implementing their change plan, we're conscious and very conscious of keeping them focused, engaged, and invoking their own strengths and internal motivation for change. As we continue to work with individuals with lived experience with substance use, um, whether it's changing their alcohol use, other drug use, MI is evidence-based, is the best practice style, and can help them move towards the goal that they want. So as clinicians, it's important that we are able to sort of check in with ourselves to make sure that we are, you know, kind of MI consistent in our questions. So, you know, are we engaging clients in an MI efficient way? Are we comfortable with, uh, you know, how this person is talking to me, asking her things, ourselves questions like how supportive and helpful am I being? Do I understand the person's perspective and concerns? You know, how comfortable do I feel in this conversation? Um, does this feel like a collaborative partnership? Do I feel like I'm dancing with my client? Or do I feel like I'm wrestling? So more questions to consider, um, to ask ourselves when we want to make sure our MI approach is consistent with focusing, is what is the person's goals for change? Do I have different goals than the person? What are we working towards, and is it a common purpose? Do I have a clear sense of where we're going? And are we moving together or a different direction? Likewise, are we going to be MI consistent in our evocation questions? So what are this person's reasons for change? You know, asking yourselves, is the reluctance uh, more about confidence or is the reluctance more about the importance of the change, whether it's a perceived desire for change? Um, you know, what change talk am I hearing? Am I steering too far or too fast in a particular direction? Am I trying to steal the oars from my client? Um, and am I the one who's arguing for change, or am I, um, you know, listening for their reasons for change? And the last consideration of questions when we look at the MI consistent process of planning is what, be, what would be reasonable next steps towards change? What would help this person to move forward? Am I remembering to evoke and to prescribe a plan versus prescribing one? And am I offering information and advice with permission? So. You know, are they seeking this information and advice? Are they open to that? And am I retaining, you know, the curiosity about what works best for this person? Um, you know, effective treatment really must be centered around a client's goal, um, providing choice and target the appropriate and realistic change plans. And effective treatment really must address all of the patient's needs or the client's needs, not just his or her drug use. So that's you know, as well, we need to be very mindful of that. Um, effective motivational counseling approaches can be brief, and certainly a growing body of evidence indicates, um, you know, the value of brief intervention, which emphasizes reducing, you know, health risk from a person's substance use, but also decreasing consumption as an important treatment outcome. Um, Successful treatment, again, helps us or keeps us from making assumptions, or MI helps us um, stop making assumptions about what a client needs and allows us to help them build motivation and skill to really make the best choice for themselves. It's not about the quantity, I'm sorry, the, the, um, the quantity of intervention, it's really about the quality of intervention that we're providing to individuals. So, so next I'm going to show um, a video. We showed a video earlier around the ineffective physician. So now we're going to show one regarding the effective physician video. This video is a great demonstration of the effectiveness of the MI approach. I want you to consider when you're watching this video what you see. Do you see the spirit of MI emerge? Do you see the use of the oars? Do you see the darn language? Do you see that collaboration and partnership between the doctor and the patient? 
And I really think that this video highlights that the doctor demonstrates empathetic reflection as well as has a real open discussion that's respective around the client's goals, it provides choice, they ask for permission, and, adjust, and it really does address the patient's needs, not just looking at um, the substance use of uh, this individual. And if there's one thing you really take away from this video is to look at effective motivational counseling approaches can be brief. So there's a growing body of evidence that indicates that there's early and brief interventions, and that demonstrates positive treatment outcomes in a wide variety of settings, specifically in substance use disorder programs, in our primary care offices, in our ER departments. Brief intervention emphasizes reducing health-related risks of a person's substance use, as well as looking at decreasing their consumption as an important treatment outcome. So this video really keeps us um, and highlights that it keeps us from making assumptions about what the client needs and allows us to help them build motivation and skill to make the best choices. So I hope you see that in the next video. Provider cues in to what the parent is saying, empathizes with her situation, and attempts to work with the parent to find a solution that fits her needs. So I wrote a prescription for antibiotics for Aiden. Okay. Um, I did want to talk to you though, I'm a little bit concerned looking through his chart at how many ear infections he's had recently, and I, I noticed that you had checked the box that someone's smoking in the home, so I was wondering if you can tell me a little more about that. Well, um, it's just me and him, and I do smoke. Um, I try really hard not to smoke around him, but I, I've been smoking for 10 years, except when I was pregnant with him, but it, everything it's so stressful being a single mom and and my having a full-time job and so it's just that's why I started smoking again you have a lot of things going on and smoking is kind of a way to relax and de-stress yes yeah some people have a glass of wine I have a cigarette <laughs> sure and it sounds like you're trying not to smoke around him why did you make that decision I know it's not good for him I mean I've read those things about ear infections and asthma and stuff and and uh, but other kids have ear infections and their parents don't smoke. So on the one hand you're worried about how your smoking might be affecting him and on the other hand you're not so sure if it's really the smoking that's causing these problems. Right, yeah. I mean he doesn't have asthma. He, I don't, he hasn't had a lot of other problems that his other friends have. So, And I've thought about quitting before in the past but I just don't, I just don't see how it's possible right now. What made you decide to quit smoking when you were pregnant? Well, he was inside me and we were sharing everything and I knew that he would get some of that and I didn't I just didn't didn't think I could live with myself if something happened to him right now though it feels almost too difficult to even manage or even to try yeah exactly how were you successful when you quit before I don't know I I think about it now I don't even know how I did it I just I just did it you know I just I just couldn't imagine like him not being born or, or going into labor early and mm -hmm. and him having problems and stuff like that all the stuff that they talk about with women who smoke so I that was just enough to to say okay you know what I'm I'm not gonna risk that mm -hmm. so the risks were so scary then that you're able to stop but yeah. they don't feel as scary to you now no I mean we're two separate people and like I said I don't I try really hard not to smoke around him I'm pretty good about that. I, I don't let other people smoke around him. Um, so I, you know. You're doing the best you can do. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But it sounds to me too like part of you really does want to quit. Yeah, I, I, I know that I need to and I, you know, keep every new year I say, okay, this year I'm going to quit smoking. But then something happens and it it just doesn't. It's and on your to-do list, it's just not making it to the top. Yeah. If you did decide to quit, on a scale of 1 to 10, where 1 is not at all confident, you don't think you could do it, and 10 is you feel pretty certain that you could, where do you think you fall right now? Probably like a 5, kind of in the unsure area. Mm -hmm. Like, I know I've done it before, so I know I can do it, but at the same time, it just seems really hard and it's sure. not the same situation. Well, what made you say five rather than two or three? 
I know, I know all the ways it's bad for me, and I don't want him to grow up thinking that it's okay to smoke. I don't want him to, to use any kind of, I don't want him to chew or, or anything like that. Um, so I know I need to, especially before he gets old enough to understand mm -hmm. what mommy's doing, but I just don't know if I can do it. Okay. So it sounds like you have a lot of reasons why you'd like to quit. You have been successful quitting in the past, and right now you're just feeling a little bit hesitant about your ability to do it. Yeah. Where do you think we should go from here? I don't know. I, I'd like some help. I just don't know what kind of help I need. Sure. So. Well, if you'd be interested, that's something I can definitely talk to you about. There are a lot of new options that can actually help people be way more successful in their attempt at quitting. There's different medications you can try. I don't like medicine. Okay. There's also a lot of support groups and classes that you can take where you have other people to go through it with you and sometimes just having that support can be a big part of it, especially for people like you where smoking is such a yeah. stress reliever. That sounds nice, but I'm not sure if I have the time for all that. Sure. It feels like something that would take up a lot of time and maybe not fit into your life. I wonder if we could talk about some options that might fit into your life. That would be really nice. Okay. Well, if you're willing, then we could set up another appointment where you could come in and we could talk more about that. I would like that. That would be great. Great. Thank you. Sure. So, um, as Vanessa mentioned, you know, that video really is a great demonstration of how effective MI can be. Um, and for the interest of time, we won't brief it anymore because we recognize we're running pretty tight on time. Uh, but just also wanted to highlight, I guess, a couple of pieces around how, um, you know, trauma-informed work and motivational interviewing really can converge um, around a number of very important principles. And, you know, the need to work collaboratively with clients really ensures that we as providers are walking the walk and not just talking the talk, um, you know, and recognizing as well that oftentimes there's a significant overlap over or between, you know, individuals who experience trauma, whether that be intimate partner violence or other sorts of, and other forms of trauma, that there's oftentimes an overlap um, in the experience of trauma and substance use disorder. So the very hard, I guess, mechanism that draws motivational interviewing is free will. Uh, sparked when true collaboration meets with the evocation of clients' desire for change, that along with respect for their autonomy and decision making. So MI provides really important and useful principles that serve to, you know, inform substance use disorder guidance of survivors who have trauma background. So just quickly, some resources. So I have up here two books. Um, we talked a lot about Miller and Rolnick, who are the, the kings, I guess, of motivational interviewing. So there's a book there that's authored by them, Preparing People for Change, as well as Rolnick was part of a book with other um, practitioners regarding health behavioral change. This is another resource we wanted to share with people. It's a very comprehensive exceptional resource. Um, you can all get it online. It's 200 and some odd pages, so you may or may not wish to print it, but it's certainly a great reference guide, um, and we can send that link out, um, or you can just Google this actual, uh, you know, Google Enhancing Motivation for Change in Substance Use Disorder Treatment. Um, it's a very, very effective um, resource by SAMHSA, and certainly, you know, highly recommended. As well, if um, you have you feel ignited today by MI and want to learn more or feeling like passionate about expanding your knowledge base, there's tons of MI workshops, especially within your local health authorities that are much more um, comprehensive and longer than just um, the talk that we did today. So keep an eye open for those and I really encourage you to take part in them. I've done some myself. Um, they've been really great. Cam H has motivational interviewing options on their site. The CCSA has an essential series that exists, and there is a motivational interviewing network of trainers called MIMP. Um, yeah, we, uh, we listed some, some references that we feel people may find helpful, but also just wanted to let people know that all of the tools that we referenced today, the decisional balance tool, uh, the readiness ruler, the change plan worksheet, and a variety of other um, tools that we, Vanessa and I, to, you know, tend to use in our own practice. We have those made available to you, um, and I think they'll, I think... They're up now, Annette put them on the resource part of this page, and I think she'll speak to that now. Um, 
Yes, absolutely. So for the interest of time, we're going to clue off. Um, wondering if people have any questions. Um, and I think Annette's going to facilitate the question period if anybody does have questions. Yes, thank you so much, Vanessa and Paula. Great presentation. Um, so we do have a bit of time for questions. So if you haven't sent in a question, uh, feel free to send it along now. Um, I guess just to jumpstart the Q&A period, um, one of our questions is pertaining to, uh, from your perspective, how does the motivational interviewing fit with other therapeutic approaches? So, for example, uh, acceptance and commitment therapy or other uh, thera therapeutic approaches that people are using in their practice? Great question. Um, I think, you know, as we said earlier, motivational interviewing can really sort of, um, it can partner with a lot of approaches very effectively. In terms of acceptance and commitment therapy, theory, um, you know, it's really great because it allows people, um, again, sort of at their own pace and in their own readiness to, um, you know, come to their own place of acceptance. One of the things about motivational interviewing is it really does allow people, um, you know, a safe space. Um, to sort of move forward towards change, you know, and based on their own desired recognition of internal driving mechanisms. Um, Vanessa, did you have anything else that you wanted to sort of add to that? Um, I think as someone who um, uses acceptance um, and commitment therapy in practice, I think MI actually has a real spirit that lends itself to that practice. Um, ACT is all about kind of motivating people towards those moving towards behaviors as opposed to moving away. Yep. And I think MI is really all about how we encourage and foster that. And it gives us a way that does it that's client-centered, that's respectful, empathetic, and that's encouraging, which regardless of if we're looking at a change in regards to substance use, lifestyle change, or however you know an individual presents on what they're looking, um, MI can be... It's very versatile, and it can be exercised, I would argue, um, in any reference to change that someone's looking towards. And I think that it actually has a lot of spirit that we see in the act, and it can help those individuals really foster growth in those moving towards behaviors. Well, thank you. Uh, our next question is, someone is wondering if you can comment a little further on how MI is influenced by the clinician style, and maybe an example could be helpful there. Absolutely. So MI, motivation is really influenced um, by the clinician's style, right? So it's around that relationship that we build with our clients. It's around that sense of safety that we, we um, create in the therape therapeutic alliance. Um, you know, for example, when individuals are coming and they're highly ambivalent, perhaps they've been, you know, as I suggested earlier, either dragged or pushed into um, treatment versus, you know, coming of their own volition. Um, you know, oftentimes people are coming very, um, feeling very nervous, feeling very apprehensive, perhaps very resentful, um, maybe very guarded. And so, you know, if they're met with empathy, if they're met with acceptance, if they're met with true compassion, um, if there's a sense of absolute worth that's being demonstrated by the clinician in their interaction, then that's going to enhance the internal motivation of the individual to continue towards the change process, you know, versus if an individual is, you know, being received um, in a way that they're feeling judged, that they're feeling shamed, if they're, you know, feeling that they're being told what they need to do versus being asked what they wish to do, um, you know, that is going to be very, um, you know, we're going to see two very different outcomes in those two approaches by the clinician. So, you know, by enhancing, or sorry, by employing the motivational interviewing strategies, the elements and the spirit of MI, you know, we're really creating that safe space and that therapeutic alliance where, you know, as we mentioned, we hope that people are feeling that they're dancing side by side with their clinician versus being dragged, kicking, screaming towards the change um, that's desired. And I'd just like to add that I believe, and I know you'll be tired of hearing me say this, but I, I use MI in all aspects of work that I do because I feel that it is very, it has very transferable skills. And just like we talked about with the spirit of MI that every individual has their own intrinsic motivation as well as their own strengths that we're going to draw on, 
I truly believe that clinicians have their own approaches um, and their own strengths that we draw on as well. So regardless of you know, the lens that you work for, work from as a clinician, I think that you can take MI and, you know, look at where your strengths are and then work and holly the strengths of the individual and work alongside with them to foster their motivation. Um, I do truly believe, regardless of your approach or the work that you're doing, there's parts of this that really can be transferable and really can enhance and foster your therapeutic relations relationships with your clients. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, we do have time for one more question. Um, so this question is, how does uh, MI fit with mandated clients? Is it helpful or useful? And do you have any recommendations for its use with mandated clients? Absolutely. Uh, motivational interviewing initially was developed um, in recognition that a lot of clients are coming kicking and screaming or being dragged kicking and screaming into treatment for substance use disorder. Um, and they could have been, you know, mandated clients. And I'll use impaired driving as an example. Um, for anybody who's familiar with the impaired driving program that exists in the province, um, you know, I'm in this region, Ms. Paula, I coordinate and facilitate the impaired driving assessment program. Every single person who comes into that program is mandated. None of those individuals are coming into treatment because they want to be there. Um, and motivational interviewing in this approach really um, is the basis of the entire program of our impure driving assessment in recognition that, as you know, we've mentioned earlier, everybody is motivated towards something. If, for example, an individual is coming into treatment because they've had an impaired driving conviction and the province tells them you require, um, you know, a program with addiction services prior to being reinstated to drive, we, you know, we can't make assumptions that that individual is motivated towards substance use behavior change. We can make somewhat of an assumption that an individual is, um, you know, motivated towards um, attending the program because they want to be able to drive again. They want to be reinstated to drive. They want to, re you know, renew their privilege to drive in the province. Um, so, you know, motivational interviewing helps us, um, you know, recognize that ambivalence is going to be a natural part, resistance is going to be a natural part of the change process. One of the things that's really cool about that group is that although every single person comes into that group as a mandated client, I would venture a guess, and this is my own numbers, I'm just pulling um, from my own experience in facilitating the program, I would say 90% of those who come from that program, who initially entered the program because they had to, um, express their, um, you know, their, their gratitude for completion of the program, you know, talk about all kinds of change that they now are ready to make, or they start to at least, you know, move from not even recognizing a need to change or not feeling that there's any need to do anything differently to gaining insight and awareness and an internal desire to do things differently going forward. And that entire program is based around the principles of motivational interviewing, that, you know, recognizing that most clients are, um, you know, not necessarily coming because they want to be there. And to add to Paula's point, um, I was involved with the impaired driving program for years as well, um, as well as other groups that we ran outside of that in regards to um, adult addiction services. And we talked a lot about how MI really fosters people to re-engage in services when they require it or to continue align that change process. And we saw a lot of people transition from completion of that program to attending our drop-in groups to reaching out to schedule individual um, counseling. So I do, I mean, I think experientially for our own experience as clinicians, we see firsthand that um, it certainly does work. Yeah. I think it's important for us as clinicians to recognize that, you know, the only success, you know, we don't only see success when we're talking about substance use disorder treatment, abstinence is not the only gauge for success, right? It's one of a variety of gauges towards success. Um, so, you know, an individual who is um, mandated to be in treatment, the fact that they've shown up for treatment, the fact that they've engaged the process of treatment in itself shows that there's motivation towards something. So MI allows us to meet them where they are, you know, in not forcing change upon them that they're not ready, but really in allowing, um, you know, a discussion where they're feeling safe, where they're feeling valued, where they're feeling that they have input, um, you know, towards what that change needs to look like. Wow, I can't I can't believe we're we're uh, at the uh, 90 minute mark. My goodness, um, 
uh, sorry if we didn't get to your questions, uh, but uh, certainly a lot of great information and great questions that were coming in. So thank you for that. Uh, so I do want to, to wrap up our session uh, for this afternoon and want to give a huge thank you to Vanessa and Paula for this informative and stellar presentation and for sharing your knowledge, experience, and expertise with all of us today. And certainly a lot of important information was covered, and we hope that this webinar sparked your interest in motivational interviewing and how it might be helpful to you in your practice. Vanessa and Paula, your passion for and pride in the work you do was evident throughout your presentation, and, and uh, for, certainly for the work that you do in the area of mental health and addictions is inspirational. And I want to thank you both for taking time out of your, what I know is a very busy schedule to facilitate this webinar for us today. Uh, the PDF of the PowerPoint presentation is available on the resource section of the webinar platform along with the, the practice resources that Vanessa and Paula provided and spoke about throughout the presentation. A recording of the webinar will be available on the NLCSW YouTube channel in the, in the next uh, week or so. Um, and also just to let you know that members may claim 1.5 CPE credits under the required category of workshops uh, as per the NLCSW CPE policy for attending this webinar. And we also ask uh, that you complete the evaluation form that will appear on your screen as well. Uh, so on that note, thanks everyone. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day and stay safe.